side with more rumors of wars to come. Don't panic or give in to your fears for the breaking apart of the world's systems is designed to happen. But it won't yet be the end. It will still be unfolding. And so when we see things from a biblical perspective as a child of God, as a, as a man or woman of God that, that's locked in step with Jesus, as, as we walk through this road where he has us going, we understand that things are going to happen, that we don't have to be fearful, we don't have to fret, we don't have to uh, be troubled in our spirit. Uh, wars and rumors of wars are going to happen. Uh, nation is going to rise against nation. It, it's a fact. And I believe that every aspect of our life, just because I'm a believer, doesn't mean I'm not going to have any problems in life. Right. Doesn't mean I'm not going to have any troubles. Doesn't mean I'm not going to have any pressure. You know, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But he didn't say you wouldn't have pressure. He said you're going to have tribulation in the world. Right. The word means pressure. There's going to be things that go wrong. The car is going to break down. You're going to lose your job. You might get physically sick. In every aspect of our life, we have to make it clear in our mind, I am not going to be troubled by this. I am not going to be troubled in my mind through this. I am not going to be frightened. I am not going to be alarmed. You say, Pastor, that is impossible. It's not impossible because Jesus or the Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The sufficiency of grace will, will help you to move mountains if you really believe that His grace is sufficient enough. Be because what we do is we, we compare grace to the way we feel. So if I'm not feeling right about a situation or my world is rocked or turned upside down and I don't feel, then it's almost as if grace is insufficient where he said that you need to realize that in your weakness, my grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect. God, in his infinite wisdom, does not want you and I to depend on anyone or anybody or anything other than him right. to draw strength from. Amen. And that's hard. I posted something on Facebook some weeks back. The hardest thing we have a problem with is what God allows in our life. And it is so true. We think we're believers and something happens. Oh, what's going on? And, you know, of course, the adversaries in the sidelines just waiting for to, to watch how your mind's going to uh, ingest that thing and, and you're troubling that you're going to get. And so he'll be right there to point fingers and accuse and, and condemn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we have the spirit of God. We have the word of God. The, the Bible talks about the armor. One of the, one of the elements of the armor is the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God, the rhema of God. And a swordsman that would just pick up his sword and get into the arena with somebody and just wildly start going like this, he'd probably end up getting stabbed real quick. But the one that would get into the arena and would be able to strategically use that sword, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. The word of God is designed for us to use strategically, not just randomly. Sometimes we quote random scriptures that have nothing to do with the issue. You don't bind the devil by random scriptures. You bind principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world by using the rhema of God or the word of God specifically that comes against the spirit of depression, that comes against the spirit of oppression or whatever it is that you're, you and I are up against. Souls are set free by strategically using the word of God to come against strongholds, <clears throat> using the dominion and authority of God. And so... When we see these things happen, you know there's a player that's involved that's really ramping up, bringing it to the next level, if you please, and God's going to allow it to happen. And he's given you and I all that we need to function in that environment. Yes. And we've got to come to the place, yes, this hurts. Yes, I don't understand. Uh, God, give me wisdom. But it doesn't rock my world to the point where I leave him or leave the church or forsake whatever. Right. We need to understand that the end is not yet. Right. Right. 
And so Jesus, his statement in Matthew 24 was, because iniquity would abound, the love of many would what? Wax, 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 wax cold. cold. Because sin would abound and, and, and iniquity would abound. People would allow their hearts to get, get hardened. And they, they, they would say, oh, why should, why should I do this? Or I don't have to do this. Or, I don't have to do that. And the narrative just goes on and on and on. And if I can replace my thoughts with God's word, if I can somehow find that place at his feet where I can learn from him and allow him to teach me how to respond, how to walk, how to act, he desperately looks for that kind of fellowship with you and I. Again, Matthew 24, seven, uh, 6 in the Passion Translation. You will hear of wars and revolutions on every side. With more rumors of wars to come. Don't panic or give in to your fears. For the breaking apart of the world's systems is designed to happen. But it won't yet be the end. It will still be unfolding. And so as we walk, we don't walk like we have blindfolds on. We walk with wisdom. We walk with understanding. But we also understand that th though there be no fruit on the vine or no cattle in the stalls or, or no wheat that's hi hi hidden away, and, yes. and I may not know where, where I'm going to eat the next time, and I may, yes. not, I, I, I may not really know what tomorrow is going to bring. But yet I will rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Hallelujah. I will rejoice in what? My circumstances? Whether I've got all my ducks in a row and I'm feeling good? No. I'm going to joy in the God of my salvation. And when in that element I can rejoice in Him, then He makes my feet like what? Hind's feet. That means that those deer... You ever see those things go up this, up, almost like a, a vertical, uh, up, up a side of a mountain? I, I don't know what it is about their hoofs. I've never seen it, but they can, they can walk on rock and they can, they can jump on ledges. And it's like you and I would be scared to death. Oh, my word. But that's the stability that the Holy Ghost wants you and I to understand. I'll make your feet like hinds feet. You'll be able to stand on the edge of a cliff. And you won't fall off because you have the faith to believe that I'm going to catch you before you hit the bottom. You don't, you're not worried about this. You're not concerned about that. And please, 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 would you quit worrying about everybody else? Please. I, I mean, I, I understand. I believe in having a heart of compassion. I believe in praying for people. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in concern with someone else that don't want anything to do with God. And they, they, they have no faith. Uh, that we work ourselves up in a tizzy and, and, and we get all depressed because this person doesn't want to walk with Jesus. And, and that person, we haven't seen that one in so long. And this person, cut it out. Right. Jesus walked by and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Elijah said to Elisha, when he said, come follow me, or took his mantle and threw it at him, well, wait a minute, i got to do this, i got to kill the oxen, got to go say bye to mom and dad, whatever. And he kept on walking down. I mean, God is a compassionate God, but our compassion must come from Him. Our compassion has to be spirit-driven, not flesh-driven, because when our compassion is flesh-driven, you'll worry yourself sick. Right. You'll, you'll, you'll deflate the joy right out of you. But if we get in the spirit right. and allow a spirit of travail where there's weeping and wailing in the presence of God and the Holy Ghost is praying through you. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, we don't know what to pray for. But the spirit knows what to pray for. Right. And when you yield yourself to the Holy Ghost and allow the Holy Ghost to pray through you, not just a burst of tongues every now and then when you feel a goose bump hit you. But you're praying in the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to do the praying, do the weeping. Whatever it is that God wants you to do. We've got to understand that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Right. Right. Amen. Ephesians 6.12, I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified. We, we, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood contending only with physical opponents. 
Sometimes I know you wish you could put on a pair of gloves and boom, 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 boom. But it's not going to happen. And the devil is a whole lot smarter than you and I are. He's a master at deception. He's been dealing with this flesh and humanity since the beginning of time. He knows what bush button to push. He knows what to whisper in your ear. He knows how to get inside of your mind if you're not if you don't have that helmet of saved thinking. And he'll he'll deceive you. He'll he'll get your thinking. Well, oh, he'll use people's facial expressions to get a hold of you. He'll he'll use words to to fire a dart at you. There's all kinds of tricks that he has up his sleeve to try to defeat you and I to try to get us to get our eyes off of him and get our eyes on the world or on people Thank you, Jesus. and from my perspective every time that's happened I've gotten in trouble if you're concerned what people think about you if you're concerned about how oh this, oh, this person didn't shake my hand or oh this didn't say hello or oh, whatever it, it just oh, oh yeah, I saw him he rolled his eyes at me I told this story before I remember preaching in the Bedford church and there had to be a hundred people in our congregation and I preaching when I got done preaching this this dear brother came walking up to the altar and got in my face I said brother Kevin you you looked at me all that time you were preaching you were preaching at me <laughs> I said man I, I said what do you want me to do face the wall and preach to the wall I said how can you say with a hundred people sitting in this congregation that you were the only one that I was speaking to Maybe he wanted to have the, should have had the ears to hear what the Holy Ghost was trying to say. Well, I have no idea, but, but that's, what, that's what flesh will do. That's what your mind is capable of doing. Right. Yep. We wrestle against the depotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. If God would open up our eyes to the spirit world and we would see some of the demonic activity that is going on out there, what would you do? Would you run? Would you hide? Or would you stand with your weaponry on, with your shield of faith? He didn't say if you came up to a serpent, oh, oh. I mean, I'll do that with spiders, but not serpents. <laughs> I do that with my wife. <laughs> he said, you'll tread upon serpents. You'll tread upon scorpions. He said, as a matter of fact, you have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you I'll admit if you step into that arena you better know how to fight right just ask the seven sons of Sceva but Jesus said you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you well yeah that's talking about being a witness yeah how are you going to tread upon serpents and scorpions? You're going to go into places where serpents and scorpions exist. The subtlety of Satan's influence. The sting of his accusations. That's what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about real snakes and real scorpions. But he was dealing with humanity. He was dealing with flesh. In the last days, he said that, that uh, evil men and seducers would wax worse and worse. Don't read the headlines or hear something on the news and get all flustered and all upset and all angry. You can feel your blood pressure going up and if you had a thermometer, you'd probably pop it. No, this has to happen. And God's placed me here to watch it happen and to be a labor together with him while it's happening. Right. Praise God. In Matthew chapter 7 and, and verse 13, Jesus clearly told us and I'm, I'm convinced that, that you know, the, the, the Bible talks about a narrow way. And uh, I can't fit in places that I, used to, that I used to be able to fit when I weighed such and such. But now that I weigh such and such, it's really hard for me to, to fit in some places. You know. But the deeper we get into the end times, the way is going to get narrower. You know why the way is going to get narrower? Because there's going to be so many people growing the, going the broad way that it's going to look like the narrow way is almost non-existent. Because you'll be an outcast. 
Because you won't fit in with everybody else. And they'll know you don't fit in with everybody else. And so your narrow way that you're trying to walk and you're trying to live is going to get narrower and narrower. But hear the words of Jesus, Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Any kind of interest that you and I have outside of Jesus in this book, and I'm not talking about relationships or just the common sense stuff. I mean, I've dealt with people through the years, pastored people through the years. I remember one family in particular told this dear brother, man, you know, all your kids go to, go to uh, what they did, that soccer, I think it was, on Sundays. Of course, all the games are on Sundays now. Yeah, amen. And I, I said, brother, I said, you are teaching them that that is more important than this. They yeah. need to be in Sunday school. Preach about it. Ah, well, you know, you know, to this day, he's no longer walking in truth. And to my, understand, my knowledge, his children are not walking in truth. Or, let's say, in relationship with Jesus. Matter of fact, he married somebody out of the faith. So where your treasure is, your heart is going to be there. And you might be able to survive it for a little bit. You know, you can, you know, we can fluff it for a little bit, but eventually, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but you do change. Your body changes all of a sudden. You know, all of a sudden, you know, what was exciting to you, prayer meeting, church, hearing the word of God, you know, being a witness for Jesus, all of a sudden that go because this this way is getting narrow. Now, now i got to make a commitment if I'm going to walk with Jesus. And oh, my people I work with don't walk with Jesus. And people I live with don't walk with Jesus. And, and, but Jesus said it. This is how it's going to be. Don't, let it be, don't get afraid. Don't, don't get all riled up. Don't get clamorous. And wow, what's going on here? Because Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. You see, I found that when I enter into the narrow gate, I need other people that have entered into the narrow gate. Yes. Other people that love Jesus. Other people that love the Word. Other people that are faithful to the house of God. Faithful to the kingdom of God. So it's the devil's a liar. He'll say, well, you know, you enter into that narrow way. Nobody's going to like you. And you're going to lose all your friends. They're not friends if they're not walking with Jesus. Right. Especially if they're trying to draw you away from Jesus. Right. And it's amazing the friends that you'll all of a sudden have when it comes time to go to church. Oh, come on, and we're having this. Right? Come on, you're gonna even family members. Oh man, we're having a we're having a party on Sunday. Well, rather than say, you know what, I've got church on Sunday. As soon as I'm done, I'll be right over there. So, oh, pastor, that that that's mean. Well, you know, we gotta we gotta take into consideration family members. And I'm sorry, folks, I don't find that in the scripture. No, sir. Seek ye first. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. When I stand before God, I'm going to have to give an account by myself. Yes. My wife's not going to be alongside of me. My kids are not going to be alongside of me. None of you guys are going to be alongside of me. I'm going to have to give account to what I've done in this flesh by myself. And so the, the choices that are really getting narrow now is I've got to, I've got to be a man of prayer. I've got to be a man of the word. I've got to be faithful to the presence of God, to the family of God, to the body of Christ. Because this wide gate is getting wider and wider and broader and broader. It's the way that leads to destruction. Jesus said it. And there are many who go in by it. That's why the world doesn't want Jesus. They're not interested in Jesus. They, and there's no moral absolutes anymore. And there's hatred. And they'll, they'll, they'll stab you just for looking at them or, uh, the wrong way. They'll shoot you just because you, you look cross-eyed. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But we want to be pleasing to everybody. Be pleasing. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You do your best to follow peace with all men, but if all men don't want to be peaceful for you, shake the dust off your feet and move down the road. Yep. Luke 13, 24. Kind of the same variation of Matthew 7, 13, but I, but I like the way 
Luke says it because he uses a, a word, Luke 13, 24, he said to them, strive. Everybody say strive. 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 The Greek word for strive literally means to struggle. It literally means to compete for a prize. Figuratively, it means to contend with an adversary. And Jesus is saying, strive to enter through the narrow gate. In 2023 terms, do whatever you got to do to get in through the narrow gate. You have to kick, you have to scream, you have to crawl over people. That woman with the issue of blood could have cared less what people thought. Did she have to get on her hands and knees and make her way through that crowd? And, oh, and she, I don't think she, well, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, uh, excuse me, excuse me. She had one focus, and that was to touch the hem of his garment. And if you and I need to have a focus, I've got to get a hold of Jesus. I've got to talk with Jesus. I, I, I got to give myself to Jesus. I, I want to offer my body as a living sacrifice to him. I, I want to be as holy as he requires me of. And we don't allow the things of this world. As the songwriter wrote, if you just turn your eyes upon him and look full in his wonderful face, the things of this world will what? Grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But we're not going to be able to patty cake our way in. Because according to strive, it means that you're going to struggle. You're going to be in competition. The world's competition, one receives the prize. And we're all in this race to get to heaven. And when I, I think of how influential people are in our lives, where we've got to be careful what we say, and we well, let's be nice, and, and, and that's good, and it's in its right order, that's a good thing to do. But when it comes to your soul, when it comes to your salvation, when it comes to your strength in the faith, separate yourself. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You know why they won't be able? is because there'll be too much baggage and you can't get through the eye of a needle with a whole lot of baggage in your hand. Right. It barely fit a camel. Thayer's Greek lexicon of that word strive means to endeavor with strenuous zeal, strive to obtain something. I think, Brother Olson, we're right at the edge of it, it's time to be so heavenly minded that we're earthly no good. <laughs> and I was taught when I, when I first came to the faith, well, don't become so heavenly minded that you're earthly no good. Um, anybody see what time it is? <laughs> narrower, narrower. Jesus, what do I need to get narrower? Praise God. Stand with me tonight. Appreciate the word of God. And I just, I just, you know, Jeremiah came to a place where, where he uh, said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to talk about him anymore. I, I'm not going to bring up the word of God. I'm not going to declare what he's telling me to declare. But then it, something happened to him and he, he said, you know what, I tried. <laughs> I tried, but it was like a fire in my bones. Yes. And that's what the word of God needs to be in each and every one of us. Take your religious tradition and toss it to the wind. Take trying to do everything to be pleasing to everyone else and toss it to the wind. Ingest the word of God. Find yourself drinking living water every single day. Find yourself sitting at his table and eating the bread of life. It'll save your soul. It'll save my soul. It'll keep us. It'll preserve us. As Paul said in, in, uh, was it in Thessalonians chapter 5, I think he, something to the effect of that, that uh, I pray that your whole spirit, body, and soul would be uh, preserved blameless until the, the coming of the Lord. That's Thessalonians 5.23. Thank you. That's the, that's the whole concept we, because we're spirit beings and, and we have a soul and uh, we have a body. And, you know, people, people that feel that, that, that they can... Um, you know, kind of dress the way they want and live the way they want and go with the way they want, just do their thing and, 
And you people that are, that believe in this holiness business, you're you're really extreme. You're you're one of the hardliners. Well, that's all right. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it when I get to the Amen. other side. Amen. And I found that the more I can separate myself from the things of this world, the better I feel. Amen. And the stronger I feel. And the as stronger my faith is. Praise God. Your labor is not in vain. You're not here in vain tonight. You're here and the word is going forth. And if you let the rhema uh, write the law on your inward parts, he'll, he'll keep you. Because when you walk out that door, the adversary is going to come and try to take it all away, Brother Charles. doesn't want you being faithful to Bible study. He doesn't want you being faithful to the house of God. And you got a whole lot of Broadway people going down the streets. And, hey, come on, come on, join us. Come on, hey, come on, come on. They may look happy now, and they may even be economically better off than we are right now, but you know what? One of these days, this corruption is going to put on incorruption, and this mortal is going to put on immortality. Oh, my friend, death, where is the sting? Grave, where is the victory? It is going to be well worth the prize that Jesus is going to give us when we get to the other side. Mine. And the best part of it is, Brother Mike, we're not going to remember anything about what took place here. Jesus. Because there's not going to be any weeping. There's not going to be any oh, wailing. Oh, there's not going to be any gnashing of teeth in heaven. But people that are on the Broadway, they're going to have the same lust that they had in the flesh and the earth. They're going to feel that lust in, in, in eternity. The same itch that they had to scratch through their vices, they're going to want to scratch in eternity. That's the torment. They're not going to be able to satisfy their heart's lust and their minds and all the ugly stuff, the sin. It, it just They're not going to be able to get anything. And that's what's going to cause them to weep and wail and gnash their teeth. But you and I... Sister Olson, according to the book, we, we got at least a thousand years to reign with as kings and priests with the Lord. You show me with this world, you show me some government that can offer you that. They'll offer you the material things that are going to turn to dust. But Jesus says, if you walk with me, you'll rule and reign with me as kings and priests. First John 5, 3 in the Passion Translation says true love for God means obeying his commands I haven't I haven't arrived there yet I'll be honest with you the, the things I shouldn't do I do the things I should do I, I, I don't do and it's easy many times for me to say oh wretched man that I am but Paul didn't stop there Thank God. He said, with my mind, I serve the law of God. With my flesh, the law of sin. I, I see this war going on inside of me. Yes, God doesn't take our flesh away. It seems to be always a challenge, always a struggle. Uh, our minds, our, our bodies, noises, narratives. It just goes on and on. It's like you want to go, when's this going to end? You know when it ends? When every single day you find yourself sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him. Be like Martha if you want. Jesus, would you tell her to get in that kitchen and, and help me serve? Oh, Martha, Martha. Sometimes you can hear his voice. Oh, Kevin, Kevin. So encompassed about with all this stuff. All this worrying. See, true love for God means obeying His commands and His commands don't weigh us down as heavy burdens. The commandments, King James says, are not grievous to us. Does flesh always want to obey the commandment? No. Not unless you bring your body under subjection. So there's times you have to deny the flesh. There's sometimes your flesh will win and you have to repent and say, oh man, Lord, I blew it. Forgive me in Jesus' name. And you get back in the race. You pick yourself up and you keep on keeping on. Because as soon as you and I get to a point where we say, ah, oh, what's the use? It's going to start a downward slide. In Jesus' name. Father, we worship you today. We're so thankful for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for your forever settled word. I pray your rhema would go forth not return void to you, Jesus, and you would call to our remembrance the, 
the words of God that you have spoken to us. We believe, Lord Jesus, that we are in the last of the last days. I pray, Father, whether it's somebody watching right now or whether it's somebody in here in this house, ask your Lord in Jesus' name that you would germinate the seed. Plant it in us, Lord, and bring it to surface at the time, at the right time, my God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and to those who are the called according to your purpose. Help us, Father, to identify them. I know you don't tell us everything. I know you keep things from us, Lord Jesus. And it's like we walk and we see through a glass darkly. One of these days it will be face to face, but until such a time will help us to understand there is a depth both of the riches and knowledge of God how unsearchable are your judgments and your ways past finding out we believe that tonight we face that fact tonight and we believe Lord Jesus that if you will help us take one step at a time day by day precept upon precept line upon line here a little and there a little. You respond to faith always. You respond to faith and hunger. You respond to those that seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. You seek those that want to be a labor together with you. And we're asking God that you would be glorified. And as you have purposed it in heaven, we ask that it would be evident. We ask that it would prevail. And in the process, let your name be sanctified. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. And everybody say, Amen, Amen. 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 Praise God.